I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Tony Hill is known globally as a thought leader. He's been recognised in the scholarly arena, holding multiple doctorates and advisors in the political, economic and in agricultural fields. He has many accolades, uh, too many to mention, um, in the time we have today, so I, I won't touch on all of them. But some include conducting a review on climate change and policy response to climate change for the federal, state and territory governments of Australia from 2007-2008. We're very lucky to have him beaming into us uh, from just east of Canberra. I'd like to welcome to the centre box, Tony Hill. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, to be everybody uh, this session I'm in the range 2021 uh, in Longreach. Uh, I'm just sorry that I couldn't be with you in person, but of course, and that we need to keep everybody in the uh, pandemic and COVID situation. And um, I, as was just mentioned, I'm coming to you from the lands of uh, the Ngunnawal and the Yuan people uh, just east of Canberra. Uh, so, uh, certainly pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, it's very exciting to be joining you for this discussion, but I think someone's pulled up the profile because most of I haven't done, so I've done something else, but, uh, but not most of those things. And I just want to make it clear that I don't hold multiple doctorates, so, uh, so that wasn't me. Uh, but I am very happy to be talking about and challenges for the rangelands. Do so today. Save a network of Alan Say. And so uh, there's very much a strong theme of holistic management that will come through uh, later in the presentation. But to get us started, uh, this is the, the remit that I was given for today's talk to get people thinking. Do that. Uh, to look at what some of the successes and challenges are for the rangelands and to talk particularly about how cons conservation and production can coexist in the rangelands. And that last dot point there, uh, challenging scientific thought, I would never get a reputation of scientific method, method which I think is one of the, the huge uh, cultural achievements of the human race to come up with a scientific method of thought. Uh, what I would be challenged is some of the methodologies that have been used by scientists in trying to understand the way that uh, well, particular and conservation can fit together uh, over the years. So uh, to talk about where are the rangelands? Well, this map that was provided to me the organisers of your event uh, covers something like 25% of Australia, and uh, I think the fascinating thing is that that uh, that oatmeal coloured area stretches right to the north coast of Australia, which is very much in the monsoon uh, type weather systems. Um, what uh, our federal department of agriculture says: 75% of Australia can be regarded as rangelands. And in 1999, there was a report carried out or, or issued under the auspices of two ministerial councils, the Environment Council and the Agriculture and Management Council. And it talked about the definition of the rangelands. It said that there's no clear country for them uh, and rangelands are conditions. But generally, they are the lower rainfall variable climate, arid of Australia. And there's a bunch of ecosystem types, including native grass, shrublands, and of course, the northern areas of tropical savannah woodlands. So this rain concept is all the way, according to that report, uh, to the slopes and plains. It gets uh, well into the settled territories as well as the more remote areas of Australia. Work in the rangelands. I uh, pulled up a couple of uh, quick Googles there. Uh, managing invasives, uh, 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 rescuing the uh, biodiversity, monitoring the rangelands. So various things are regarded at least by Google. 
tracking successes, but point two uh, under the success category uh, are the research background that's been okay. carried out by particularly by cooperative research centres uh, over nearly 20 years now with two CRCs uh, for tropical savannas and then uh, the CRC for remote economic participation all had interesting uh, projects in the rangelands areas and I remember particularly the tropical savannas rangelands and their contribution to monitoring and assessing fire in the rangeland in the northern Australia area of, of the rangelands. Uh, Bush Heritage Australia has been active of more recent times kind of more of a broad uh, ecological health perspective and they claim are based on science uh, and then in wildlife conservancy or areas of rangelands uh, but the particular focus on protecting habitats for endangered species. That Bush Heritage approach you know focuses on a number of different landscape management issues fire management, erosion control, feral animals, reducing grazing pressure, restoring waterways and weed control. And I'm sure all the topics would be very familiar to in our community. So that's, that's my snapshot of successes. Uh, the challenges tend to go on much more extensively. And here's a paper that I picked up uh, earlier this year uh, from a number of uh, well-sourced university researchers that existential to survival, meaning human survival, with 19 identified Australian ecosystems already collapsing. And you'll see all those numbers scattered across the map of Australia there, uh, with a number of them uh, focused on bushlands. Uh, the one, two, three, and four numbers tend to be more coastal and around the reef. Uh, so I'm not picking up particularly on those, um, but let's have a look at what they actually did by uh, substantially under threat. And what they're talking about, this state of collapse, uh, is that these ecosystems are unlikely to recover. That's a very dangerous situation for any ecosystem. And ones that they focused on for the rangelands were the western central arid, uh, the Georgia Gigi, Georgina Gidgee Woodlands in Central Australia and a few uh, aspects of the Murray-Darling Basin, the waterway marine aspects. When we focus on those words, we say these are ecosystems are unlikely to recover. You know, that's a very scary problem. And so um, to the extent that rangelands cover 75% of the Australian landmass, uh, they're very uh, severe uh, threat not only to uh, to human activities in those areas or, or our biodiversity uh, but also in planetary uh, terms. So let's get back to where is this range management practices up to and again going back to 1999 for the two ministerial their quote and this is the one that I pulled out is that past management practices have led to significant areas of the rangelands being degraded, calling into question their long-term sustainability under current uses. And what are those current uses? Well, according to economic terms, and uh, mining is top there at 12 billion, tourism comes in uh, much lower at 1.7, and by the time you get the agricultural activities, less than a billion dollars. But I would argue that in terms of impact on the landscape, uh, you probably, uh, in terms of aggregate number of uh, hectares, you're probably in So uh, the mining tends to be more of a point focused thing, whereas the meat and wool production tends to be much more extensive. But these comments and from ministerial that significant areas of the rangelands are being degraded under these management practices. And then, of course, we've got national and global challenges. Uh, anybody in southeastern Australia would be very familiar with the drought that we experienced for a couple of few years recently, very severe, uh, contributing to our situation with megafires. And then 
uh, followed of course by the inevitable floods, uh, but also challenges of food security and the current one, pestilence and pandemics. So let's just have a look at the circumstances and I picked out a couple of your met weather systems here uh, to see if you could identify what's been going on in terms of climatic context uh, for the rangelands in Australia. And I think the most fascinating part of that Devon, Devon Court Station annual rainfall chart the amount up is that the blue line, the average line, pretty much reflects a continuous stable set of rainfall data over the last uh, more than a decade, uh, more than a hundred years, more than a century. Uh, there are a couple of gaps in that rainfall. So just just uh, of those and one of the things that's interesting there is that uh, every 20 years, 30 years or so get those peak rainfall events, maybe a bit more frequently at times and perhaps you can identify since 1980 uh, a significant variability in the rainfall that's occurring basically depending on this amount of precipitation coming into the the region that's reflected by that rainfall chart um, over the over the last century or so, and then if you uh, analyse that situation a bit further, you can look at what happens to river flows in that situation, and it becomes much more. Every decade, there uh, there's a substantial peak in water flow in that particular area, uh, which is closer to Alice Springs. So, in a sense, the two locations are not closely uh, but in terms of the landscape, what we're looking at is a situation, situation there where we have to go at least a decade uh, before we get another significant drink. And so if you take the period from 2010 to 2020, uh, about a decade in there, but prior to that, we had to wait nearly 20 years from 1990 through to 2010. Uh, before we got a significant uh, that particular catchment. And I did look up the, uh, the evaporation map uh, for Australia and uh, that fell along the Tropic of Capricorn, particularly in the summer, uh, you need to have an annual rainfall of about a thousand millimetre uh, before you're even breaking even to for the evaporation rate. So uh, the conclusion I take out of that is that it's very important to think about the effectiveness of the rainfall, particularly in an agricultural production setting. So just to summarise these challenges then, we've got significant areas of the rangelands being degraded according to the Ministerial Council in 1990, and then followed up with that, the ecosystem collapse documented by Bergstrom and friends uh, in 2021 various echoes to recover and we've seen recently many of the global challenges occurring around the world. So given these dire conditions, are we trying to treat the symptoms rather than the root of the question? And my question would be, can we take a new approach? Can we shift our paradigm? How can we take a more holistic approach? Can we build on Indigenous and traditional knowledge of which there's thousands of years? And can we achieve a stable relationship between agricultural production and sustainable biodiversity? And those few questions you'll be asking. If we try to go about those things, how can we possibly do that? <coughs> so we can look to Alan Savory. In my view, Alan's given the world a huge intellectual legacy through his work creating the holistic management framework. But let me correct one common misconception. Holistic management is a form for what you should apply to land culture. It's always a decision-making framework to allow us to work through uh, decisions in the context of a holistic perspective but often complex situations. Uh, some of the elements I've listed there in the dot points, it's about developing a holistic perspective and creating a holistic context which really sets out 
the sort of parameters of the world that we're seeking to create and live in. Uh, it is built strongly on understanding ecosystem processes and therefore safeguarding biodiversity. There's a holistic decision-making methodology embedded in holistic management in the framework. It's about using appropriate tools and in many situations, maximizing the benefits of animals and their impact on the landscape as a benefit. But above all, and I would emphasize this point, it's about monitoring the effects of our decisions and our management on that land. Ultimately, we can get in and use some techniques that have recently become available to verify ecological outcomes. And then we can use that those outcomes as a basis for promoting agricultural product produce as ecologically verified and therefore building uh, farm viability. So what is this all about? It's about moving beyond a situation where our landscape is generating. And you've heard from the Ministerial Council, you've heard from the ACAD saying that situation in the Australian rangelands where soil is degrading, biodiversity is decreasing and water is evaporating. That's a de degenerating situation. Now, are we just about stabilising that situation and keeping it the same? Or are we about, which would be a sustainable approach where the land is in a static, steady state? Or are we trying to move to a situation where we're going to regenerate and deal with some of the issues that have been to a situation where soil is restored, uh, where biodiversity grows and water and carbon are absorbed. Issues. Is this possible? I've been talking about the perspective and I never understood recently that there is actually a first law of ecology. And according to Barry Commoner in his documentation in 1971, the first law of ecology is everything is connected to everything else. In other words, you can't change one part of a system without having effects through it. And Alan Savory has taken that further his key insights. A holy perspective is essential management. In other words, nature functions in holes. And the thing that we love to do in the chart on the right there is the um, seasonal rainfall zones of Australia uh, produce Bureau of Energy that we love to do four lines on because it helps our limited intelligence uh, to understand what's going on. And so I asked in the rangelands area, if you look at Tennant Creek, what's the difference between the rainfall area and the side of the line compared to something that's just on the other side of the line? We know that it's gradation uh, always in nature. And so humans love to draw a line, create boundaries. What we need to do is to train ourselves to think more holistically. We can use the holistic management framework to do that. And so here's what the holistic management framework. I don't expect you to read the details of the of the on the left slide, uh, but uh, I hope you take away the message that there's been a lot of thinking and careful thought about the structure and the various elements that go to map forward make that holistic management framework. And I just emphasise a few of them. One is getting a holistic context. So what is the context in which we're making these decisions? What are we trying to achieve? And more importantly, we hear this from politicians very often, that it is aligned with our values in life. There is a thorough understanding of ecosystem processes, and I'll go into it in a minute. There's a bunch of tools proposed under the holistic management framework and then grazing and using grazing animals as a tool for ecological. Uh, and lastly, the most important element is making sure that we monitor our various decisions to see that we're actually achieving the results that we intended. Here's the conception of ecosystem processes from the holistic management framework. Uh, we look at it as uh, four areas of water cycle, mineral cycle, energy flow, and community dynamics. Um, by using those things, it helps us get our head around it and uh, use our intelligence to understand. But we know that all those 
aspects of ecosystem process all operate in the same environment. They're like windows on the same room. And the question that arises from these, are, are we able to work with those ecosystem sources or work with nature, or are we trying to fight with nature, trying to um, take control and direct the outcome uh, to a particular point that we've decided? We know that in the sense there's a range of environmental conditions. You know, we go all the way from arid areas of this perfect grassland uh, to tropical grasslands, probably agricultural sense. And our work recently has evolved to a definition of eco region uh, uh, of eco regions uh, in relation to this part of Australia. Um, we're particularly looking at the region of the, the rainfall of summer dominant 350 50 mils. And you look at that and you say, well there's a region or a rainfall region that stretches just about from the east coast all the way to the west coast of Australia. And how much variation could be in that? We look at the interim biographic regionalisation for Australia version 7, you see just how much variation there is. Understanding that variation and getting a background on that, whether it's the rainfall influence, it's the various region or biodiversity communities, uh, helps us to understand what's going on. In the, uh, in the whole echo region and get a perspective. Now, uh, about success stories before, and they are more external to the holistic management environment. There are some holistic management experience from Australia and elsewhere that's relevant to our discussion of the regions here. China Station in the remote Kimberley, uh, in the Northern, Northern Territory, Richard. which is one of the Soils for Life case studies. Uh, but there's also some interesting perspectives from Namibia and Argentina. Uh, we think that Australia is one of the dry points on Earth, try going to Namibia with an annual average rainfall of around 50 millimetres, and some years down a lot of 11 millimetres. And even though those can people are still managing to make a living off that land, they Similar situation in Argentina, some of their areas of agricultural production down to 50 or 70 millimetres of annual average rainfall. We're not good ecology, that was desert country. Uh, this is documented on, so you can find it at a web address. And here's the circumstance in the dry season of 1992. Uh, an overall uh, area and also a perspective of group. It's nothing living and not much capacity to support agricultural production. Compare that with 2020 when things have moved forward under a, a new approach to management of livestock in the in the lands. We all know that livestock, you know, in an unmanaged sense can create a number of different problems. But if you do the job in the right way, Kachana shows us that we can achieve pretty special. We look at Beetaloo. Uh, and I'm sorry, the progressive reveal hasn't worked here. Uh, uh, basically, Beetaloo has been working with livestock across their extensive property in the Northern Territory. And they managed to get the management approach the way by focusing on the water supply for those animals. So the middle picture you'll see there is this five mil polypipe that they use to install infrastructure right across that land. And the bulldozer there blowing those one kilometer coils of polypipe across the landscape to give them control of the water supply for those animals. I think their rule of thumb is that they didn't want animals to have to walk any more than two kilometres to a water point. And obviously you can control their location of grazing according to the water supply. So turning water, one water and turning on another one allowed you the impact of the, the animals on the land. Prior to the implementation of this system at Beetaloo, uh, what you tend to get was focus the damaging of livestock around the water point and then you'd get lack of usage across the rest of the property, which wasn't accessible easily to the 
the animals. Here's a shot from Namibia, um, a grassland there. Uh, gives you an idea of what we're talking about. A fair bit of bare ground between those tussocks. In Namibia, they've managed to implement a holistic grazing plan, which identified just where they should have their, their livestock at a particular point. And you'll see the detail of that plan day by day through the month of August 2015. So the Savory Network and Holistic Management Framework says, can we move on from this situation where we've been making too extensive a use of fire as a management tool? situation where we start to use animals. And this is the comparative study. So there's all of the holistic management was introduced in this particular creek in Wyoming. There's the after picture. A huge contrast and the documentation is provided by the Savory Institute there. Um, and they're talking about managed using holistic management resulting in 250% increase in livestock numbers in that area and you can see the, the increase in fertility that's resulted. So we held our conference called Farming for Our Love of the Land. We managed to get the live conference on this occasion uh, towards the end of March this year in Albury. And we had uh, a really widespread group of presenters uh, from multiple perspectives of regenerative agriculture. But there was one theme that emerged from all the different perspectives in that. The conference speakers were united behind this key point. Human management decisions are the key element involved. So if we take this approach to management, good results. If we take a different approach, then we don't see, achieve such good results. And in his to our conference, on Savory made the point that institute and policies tend to develop their own internal logic, which is extremely hard to. So we sit there and we think, OK, we've got these agencies that are charged with doing various aspects, but they in silos. They never get to their own, the overall perspective that is required to achieve better results. So how do we know if farming, if agriculture is truly regenerative? We've just been given savory is the tool of medical out therapy. It's a breakthrough approach to monitor health of farmland while it is continuing under reduction. Well, that's seen as a complete contradiction in terms that I think there's an implicit assumption that as soon as you put agricultural action on it, somehow you're going to destroy uh, the agricultural health and biodiversity of that land. Here's a tool that we can use to show whether ecological health is degrading or improving. And so we have the opportunity now to safeguard biodiversity and healthy ecosystem processes at the same time as having processed agricultural production, increasing soil carbon. We combine the two techniques. So ecological outcome verification gives us uh, the robust tool for measuring that ecological health. And we can then use that as a foundation for consumer branding and uh, the opportunity to choose uh, produce that's coming from ecologically verified land. I emphasize this point. It's about verification. So this is not a certification program, not another certification program. It's not another accreditation program. And it's certainly not auditing. It's about verifying ecological health. How does it work? Well, we've got annual monitoring of the international protocol. It requires limited resources to make it affordable for farmers. And it's composed of a short term monitoring component with annual and a long term monitoring component every five years. The term consists of leading indicators to give the best possible feedback as to whether the ecological in the right direction or not. And then the long term monitoring includes lagging indicators to check up and make sure that our short term is showing. Short term monitoring relies on the visual as 15 indicators. It results in calculation of ecological effects. The long term monitoring, in addition to the health uh, 
adds a careful assessment of pasture species biodiversity and some measures of soil health. We can extend include a measurement of soil carbon assessment, but at the moment that wouldn't run to trend, uh, be able to trade carbon to market. So we haven't expanded to that yet. Here's a picture of the end result of those 15 indicators, colour coded to show areas of problem and the areas of strength. Uh, and also in those four columns, W, C, C, E, F, those indicators are then mapped to the various ecosystem processes so we can get a readout of the health of those processes as well. And ultimately, we can, for a few years of monitoring, we can get a graph that shows whether things are improving or declining. It's just about all of those ecosystem processes have gone through a bit of a a well, uh, positive period in 2009, um, but by the time we've increased the number of sites, uh, we find that the situation is not as good as it was originally shown. And our overall health indicator score shows whether things are improving and very forward for actual produce everybody else to understand these messages. And we built that as a foundation for a new land called Land Market Australia with a byline of building a healthy Australia or getting into a healthy Australia. So led by farmers as a bottom-up process and structured as a new agricultural cooperative of farmers. And ultimately, uh, when our properties are verified, get access to the ecological outcome verified seal uh, to put on their project. We've been working hard to engage with businesses and consumers. So now up to about 11 businesses that are already engaging with us to take products from our verified farms and put them out into the marketplace or to, to improve their management techniques. And I know the Savory Institute is now working with at least 50 brands uh, to take these products out there. A couple of the notable ones there, uh, for instance, Kering uh, is a business that uh, supports a number of brands into the luxury market. Whenever you read about caring, there's always a billion behind their, uh, their turnover numbers, uh, but you would recognise brands such as Gucci and so forth. Um, a lot of people recognise the, uh, the Timberland brand, who brought out a line, for instance, of verified leather boots uh, into the market. Um, we get is that consumers are now very enthusiastic to get in touch with this verified supply of produce and its economic and environmental credentials to go with it. That's one of the things. Thank you very much for listening to that part of the talk. Happy to take any questions and do that. Well, thank you very much, Tony. And I also wanted to let you know we're going to give you an honorary doctorate of the NRM Rangelands Conference. So you can add that one to the next. <laughs> Bio, apologies there. Now, um, some of you may have experienced some connectivity difficulties in that session. Uh, we think it's coming from Tony's end. And so Tony is still here online with us, but we are not putting his camera in. Um, we are ready to take questions for Tony. So please pop them up in the Q&A section. Uh, here we go. Heather Neely. Uh, Tony has come through with the first question. She says, thanks, Tony. How does the ecological outcome verification or measure of EHI compare to landscape function analysis? Yes. So the key thing about ecological health index, I showed you the list of 15 visual indicators. They have been very carefully collected. EOV has been built on the shoulders of a lot of careful work in the past, including landscape function analysis. So, so the heritage of, of EOV, Ecological Index, is strong in past uh, approaches. There is a refereed publication that's now been put out that shows that even with this more limited, we are still getting robust results. Uh, the key point is effective for everybody to get involved. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Tony. Now, Paul uh, would like to know, you speak of verified farms. Who exactly is doing the verification? 
that's the key point that verification is carried out independently of farmers. So it's an independent system according to the international protocol, and it's only carried out by people to do monitoring and collect the data or ultimately uh, accredited as verifiers to then do go through the verification process. Up until this point, um, with a number of farms that we've been working with, about 50 across five states in Australia, um, pretty much 100% examination of verification uh, conclusions international verification body. So there's there's three layers involved, monitors, verifiers and international quality assurance. Is it difficult to get that um, connect with those verifiers, Tony? Uh, we make it as easy as possible. It's a logistic exercise, obviously, to get our monitors and verifiers out onto the farmland, uh, but we work very hard to coordinate so that uh, we want them involved in the monitoring exercise to be there and see the stuff on the looking at and and it's virtually universal there's a huge kind of aha moment for the farmers as they see the factors that are involved in this ecological health and of course the key point here is that uh, agriculture farming is based on an ecological foundation if you have an healthy ecological engine behind your farm, then your farm performance drop off. Mm, uh, makes total sense. We've got some questions coming in thick and fast now and I wanted to mention uh, to those of you who are joining us at home or joining us through the app, thanks to those who've put their names in, uh, double points to those who've put their full names and triple points to those who have uploaded a photo as well. Uh, so done those things please do them it helps us um, put a face to a name and engage with you better also it would help me if I knew um, in your question where you're asking it from this morning particularly if you're not in long range so into the question Sam H says thanks Tony what proportion of your land to market producers are based in the rangelands and where are the products like meat processed I would love to have more producers in the rangelands area. Um, again, trying to draw a lot on the map and define the boundary of the rangelands look thing. Uh, so we do have a few that are in the kind of more in the slopes and plains area of western New South Wales, uh, but a handful. I would love to work more closely with in the rangelands uh, across the rest of Australia. Okay, Stuart Buck says, great talk, Tony. Do you have a website or another place to find more information about the monitoring and verification process? Uh, very easy to do. So land to market, all one word, land to market.com, the website, uh, and uh, detail on the call of EOV is available from the Savory Institute, savory.global. Okay, I've just put um, that address, savory.global, uh, into the uh, discussion forum. Okay, back to the Q&As. I noticed two people, mine load a little slowly. So if you've clicked on Q&A and they're not showing up, just, just be a little patient, it won't take long. Bruce A wants to know, with a significant portion of existing degradation relating to droughts and more than 100 years ago, why do you refer to damage under current management? Bruce Alchin asks that question. My key point is that um, collectively, as a human species, we need to take responsibility for our management decisions. And I think those management decisions have been going on for a long time. I think the thing is that there were a community, a culture of humans who managed to survive on the Australian continent in like 65,000 years and as we know everything changed for that culture around 1788 uh, the change to a different cultural approach now you know there are lessons 65,000 years or more is a hell of a long time compared to 200 years I reckon there's lessons okay. we can learn from all this but 
Absolutely. Uh, Tony, I'm sorry to come in over the top of you here, but we're about to be cut off. Uh, please stay okay. online and you can make an appointment with Tony in a meeting room if you'd like to catch up with him or uh, reach out outside the conference. It's been great having you this morning. We're going to take a break now and be back with the second part of the program soon.